I want to introduce you to the idea of science fiction prototyping as a way of um, trying to assess the impact of future technology. Now science fiction prototyping is um, really the brainchild of a guy called Brian Johnson. And Brian Johnson is responsible in Intel for looking at future projects, products, for looking at how they assess products. And he's come to the idea of one way of looking and getting a feel for how technology might work in the future, for exploring an idea, is to write science fiction stories around it and express it as a science fiction story. In terms of sort of history and background, science fiction up to the 50s was, with a few exceptions, um, perhaps very much sort of fantasy. It was not necessarily aligned to science fact. And if you go back to people like Mary Shelley and Frankenstein, and you look at the Frankenstein story, the theme of that really is about um, exploring philosophical ideas. And there's almost nothing in the book to tell you how on earth um, Frankenstein puts together his monster. There's no um, interest really in, this, in any science or technology. But um, in the early 50s, some science fiction magazines started to put science facts, you know, the latest in computing or whatever at those times and the best valves they had, right next to fictional stories. And a guy called um, Asim Asimov, Isaac Asimov, was asked by his editor, can you come up with something that actually takes fiction and um, embeds it in some potential logic, some potential science fact? And he came up with his robot stories and with um, the three laws of robots, which of robotics, uh, which are fairly, um, really more still of a um, vehicle for developing fiction. But what he was doing was trying to take some science fact and put it in a story. I want to say a word about why we might do that in a minute. Um, but we can do that and look at current science and we can look at future options. So we can take some future technical possibility and explore it through the vehicle of um, stories. Now the question is then, why stories? If we look at some of the work and some of the talks we've seen here in the past, they've been really about um, looking more objectively at the overall field. So we studied futures of food technology. And there, we're, it wasn't very personalised really. It was looking at a set of systems. It was looking at how things might pan out in connections with economic systems, growing systems, changes in technology. The stuff we heard from, um, I've forgotten his name, the professor about um, car design, that really was about looking at um, high-level statistics, trends, um, trying to get some objectivity about looking into the future. But the problem there is that a lot of the technology is really not at the system level, it's at the cultural level that um, its take-up is going to occur. It's how does it go when people actually use it? How does it interact with culture? How do people feel about it? How does it change their lives? How, in difficult situations, do they manipulate and adapt the technology to actually make it work? So if we're looking into the future, it's very likely that trends will be um, developed by the way people use technology in their everyday life. So we couldn't imagine, so we see this move towards the way of mobile computing the way people interact. And that is, that is really cultural. You can't sort of take the technology and say, statistically, I can see this is going to happen. It's the way people work in their families. The way, say, in my family, you know, we had a, a, a laptop for web access, and now two of my, um, my wife and my son have iPhones. And there has been, because of the social interaction, because of the way they sort of work culturally in the family and in their lives, they're actually moving everything onto the iPhone. So the, the laptop computer now sits on a desk. And the checking of the emails, the um, typing of emails, the ordering of books from Amazon, is all happening on the iPhone. Now that is something that is difficult to explore statistically or objectively. 
So what we need is a mechanism that brings things to home, that, that creates a subjective environment where we begin to think about um, how are people act interacting, how is this affecting them culturally, how are they feeling about it, how is this affecting their behaviour. And Brian Johnson thinks that one way we can do that is by um, science fiction prototypes. And he, with a guy called Simon Edgerton from, um, I think it's the University of Exeter, I'm not sure, and Vic Callaghan from um, the University of Essex, came together and they formed a set of conferences and a site called the Creative Science Foundation. And they had a conference in Malaysia in 2010, and in Nottingham in 2011. I'm not sure they actually had one in 2012. At those, Brian um, presented his ideas and a whole series of people um, provided ideas for science fiction prototypes. And in 2011, um, DMU, ICT, produced, IOCT produced two. I did one which I will explore with you a little bit later and Toby Moores from Sleepy Dogs put in one as well. So the idea is that we look at a technology, we then write a story, preferably with human engagement and conflict that raises the issues. And I'll say a bit more about this. If we have time, I will get myself two years ago to tell you a bit more um, about a particular um, example, because I tend to forget what I was thinking two years ago. But the idea is we begin to explore the technology from a personal point of view and we connect with people and that will tell us new things. Now we can use various mediums. There's the classic short story, there's the novel. Um, I've worked on three that I very briefly want to, to look at and hopefully at the end you'll have an idea of how science fiction prototyping could work and we're opening it up for a discussion. If we have ideas, perhaps in another session, maybe in the summer, we can run a workshop and write our own science fiction prototypes. But I don't think I'll get to that point today. So I want to look at three. The first one, I've used the vehicle of a poem. And I want to set you the background and read the poem that's associated with it. Uh, the second one uses a classic story and is the one I um, presented. Well, I didn't present because I was in Edinburgh, but my um, self on the um, video presented the ideas for um, a story. And the third one, which um, I've written recently and I'm working with the CCSR on, is about the use of robots in the home. Now, any one of these has, not only are you trying to get, you're not only trying to get across some subjective ideas and get at the cultural implications, and I think it's the social context, it's the cultural stuff that will determine what happens, not the, um, the sort of technology itself. So one thing we can do, we can go back and look at Tomorrow's World many years ago when um, they were talking about sort of um, virtual offices and so on. And you can see where there are elements of culture, but there's also perhaps too much focus on the technology. Um, so you need that, but also there is not only that we can start to think ourselves about how the technology might pan out in the future, but we can actually engage audiences. We can engage the public, we can engage school kids, we can engage students through science fiction, through storytelling in a way that presenting the objective systems view of the food alternatives for 2020 might not actually work. And by engaging them, they will begin to think about the issues and say, what about this? What about that? I feel this. Well, if I used it, such and such would happen. So that's part of what science fiction prototyping is about. So I want to move into the first of three um, examples and we'll see how we go on these. The first one is around um, bioinformatics and um, gene sequencing. Because we know that um, in ten, for the 10 years, for a couple of billion, they did the Human Genome Sequencing Project. And they've now got a complete sequence. But since then, the technology has moved so fast that we're getting to a point where a complete human sequence can be done in a couple of weeks. And instead of it costing three and a half billion or whatever it was, you, know, you can get your uh, a human sequence for $10,000 or whatever. Now, the thing, there's two things about this. We can envisage a future in which having your DNA sequenced is part of um, your life ritual. It may be expected that at some point uh, we will get a sequence from you. 
Um, but there's some issues to consider because the idea that you, know, you just get your gene sequence and it is some, you know, it's objectively there and it will tell you immediately whether you're going to get certain diseases is actually really not um, a fully acceptable idea because if you look at how genes work there's at least four dimensions. Firstly there's the actual DNA sequence itself GGCC AAT or whatever that actually codes the codes some proteins but there's only 23,000 of those and if you look at something called the ENCODE project um, last year showed that a large amount of the genome has um, control sequences, short control sequences in what used to be called repetitive DNA and junk DNA but now there's very little of that and over 400,000 control sequences a lot of which are translated into, I mean are transcribed into RNAs but never become proteins are actually running things. So you have firstly you have the sequence and that is complex enough. You then have the folding of the sequence into chromosomes you then have the um, producing within sort of systems networks of the actual proteins. Do you then have the, well, and the folding of those proteins? But that's not all, because there's a time dimension. The type of things that are expressed and the way they're expressed moves over through development, and it also changes dramatically in various ways when your body is stressed by various things. So it is not a straightforward, here's your sequence, you know, that is like the value in your bank account or whatever. And there is an issue of interpretation too. What does it mean? Who's going to decide what it means? There's one other thing you need to know. Um, it's not even straightforward. If we go back to the sequencing, the way we sequence is basically called shotgun. So what you do is actually you take your um, DNA, you chop it up, and you do loads of sequences of about 300 base pairs. There's various ways. You can sequence a little bit more, a couple of thousand, but if the sequencing that you're coming out of the physical sequencing machine gets longer, then the accuracy goes down. So you, know, you can say accurately, that 300 base pair that I've sequenced, that's what it means. When it's 1,200, mm, there may be errors in it. But the problem is then, we've got this mass of um, 300 base sequences, and we've got to put together how many you know, millions and millions of base pairs to create the human genome. And the way that's done is through computing and through programs that look for homologies and begin to sequence, connect those all up. But the problem is that that is not, so there's not one approach. It depends, the accuracy you get and the variations and the way you do it depends on the algorithms that you use. So they can be different. And there's something called an assemblathon where people with various different computer programs compete to see who can get nearest to a bacterial sequence or whatever. So there's this variation. The point is that at so many levels there's going to be an interpretation. So if my insurance company says you can't have insurance because you've got gene X, that is an interpretation. Is the sequence right from the sequencer? How was it assembled? Um, does that assembly within the, all the control systems mean that actually will be expressed? Possibly not. But we may find in years to come that we're expected to get our genome sequenced. Now that's the objective stuff. That's the science. We need to put it into a framework of somebody trying to do this. Now imagine the father, imagine that when you're 15 you're expected to get your genes sequenced for um, various government purposes and insurance and health insurance and then as in any market there will be loads of companies saying we'll do it for you. How do you decide which one? And this, let's have a bit more light, is um, the father talking about the experience when he had to try and select um, a company to do the gene sequence for his son. And he says, when, it, when he was 16 and it was time to have his genes done, the adverts flooded in by phone, mail and online like credit card offers and age-related and the age-related alerts that I got for my 50th birthday and those insurance quotes for life, house and car, which depend on my rapid reply to offers which expire in the hour. The genome choices were equally perplexing, depending on an algorithm assembling the fragments generated by the machine from alumina, 
Different companies and agencies specify different formats. Rules, regulations, codes of practice have veiled the complexity. I felt the burden and surfing the competing sites, I worried about the wrenching, churning responsibility which would affect his future prospects and rights. With a all path, soap or gasp, with a virtue or utility, the 2015 winner of the Assemblathon had a certain gravity. What concerned me was a life reduced to code and point mutations, defining identity, access and acceptability in a society where I'm limited by genetic load. And as I filled in the form, I had no idea what would be found. Codification and labelling are no replacement for interpretation. But who does the interpretation? Clouds gather, shadows lengthen. My son is at the mercy of insurers, bankers and public bureaucrats where science disguises choices already made. So the aim there is to get people beginning to think about the consequences and what might happen and how a certain technology might be used. In this one, we're trying to get the feeling of a sort of worried father who realises that he's trying to make a decision, you know, like buying insurance, but if he gets it wrong, then he's affecting his son's entire life yeah. because then decisions are made and options are reduced. Now then, I mean, you may get into discussions in classes and groups to say, well, how do we legislate that? Um, should we actually have something that is going to make decisions and reduce your options for your life, particularly when it's a matter of interpretation? And if I go to somebody else, if we've seen there's so many layers within the express to get to the expression of the genome that might making a decision because you had sequence ACT, D, ACT, GG, CCC at this locus on chromosome 16, you cannot um, go abroad to Tunisia or whatever. Is that valid? Okay. So it's that type of thing. The second, um, so, is that okay? Any questions there? Let's move on to the second one where I used um, a straightforward um, short story. And I want to set a bit of the background there. This one's a bit more technical in a sense. Um, I'm aware of the li that in IT, um, the way computer systems work is very limited, really. They depend on from Newman architecture. They're really processing ones and zeros and they do exactly what they're told. There therefore is no flexibility and they're very brittle. And the thing is, when we get this illusion of um, intelligence in a system, it's not that there's actually any real intelligence there in a sense. It's that um, the instructions that the programmer have put in where um, that program has defined all the options can be run so fast, you know, billions of instructions a second, or maybe a trillions, that it looks as if it's intelligent. And we can then be deluded um, that it is intelligent. So what if, how would a system become intelligent? And another thing I called the, um, the area looking at individuality. So one thing we don't really have in computers is individuality. A computer is a machine. They all operate the same way, the same as a um, Ford Fiesta is a machine. They um, have the flexibility in the instruction set to appear to respond differently. They're only responding to an environment, a business situation, depending on the understanding of the programmer of that business situation. And um, there's also the issue that our ability to manage these type of computer systems is reaching its limits because of the complexity. We have the complexity of the web. We have complexity um, of Word, let alone other systems. So I thought that um, these are not individual systems. Current computer systems have no individuality. They're not live in any form. What if you had a different way of writing a computer system that was in some way based on sort of living networks and how a brain network, how a developmental network works. And within that you can have individuality. So we are all humans, we all have eyes and noses, but we are all different. How is that difference um, constructed um, within the um, gene sequence and within the development pathways? 
We can't do that with computers. All we can get is a little bit of um, customization of screens and so on. So the idea behind a story called Meltdown was that in a hospital, the um, com hospital computer systems become so complex they start to break down and switch off because you're reaching the limit of the machine metaphor that's um, there in the hospitals. But somewhere else, a researcher has been working on looking at a different way of building computer systems which gives them individuality and makes them, in a sense, living. And I wanted to explore that idea and get people thinking about it. So I wrote this um, story. I will only quote a very little bit of it because there's an awful lot of it. Then I stop for eight minutes to put on, I'm afraid it's me speaking a couple of years ago, which gives more of the background and explains what's going on. In this story, the hospital systems break down and the IT manager finds that um, the whole hospital is falling to bits, the IT user for twitching off. And he has a friend, he knows somebody who may have some kind of different way of writing systems that um, he can release what we call worms into the um, hospital systems that will um, halt the degradation. So that's very much the sort of, it's not based on any immediate science fact, but it's exploring an idea and getting people to think about the um, difference between a computer and a living system and this lack of individuality in machines, you know, and, um, IBM AS400 is the same, whatever it's doing, it's a machine, whereas we're all different but we're all humans, and to ask what could happen if a computer system um, operated in a different way. And I set that to get people thinking. I also set at the same time the IT director's wife is pregnant and as the hospital systems are falling to bits, she um, goes into labour and goes into hospital. So you also have the stresses between the wife and the husband because the husband is trying to deal with the loss of the hospital systems. And he eventually goes off to find a friend from college who runs a company that um, produces um, individual living computer worms that um, can be put into the um, hospital systems and will eventually start sorting things out. So I'll just read a bit of one section. So I, I pay the taxi driver my last few coins. It was worth that to hear about his, that's the taxi driver's life. A divorce and remarriage in quick succession, addiction to golf. And the state of the taxi business sounded almost chaotic as our patient information system. Peter answers the door, tall and thin, a thoughtful giant. I've known him since university. If he's surprised to see me, he doesn't show it. Peter, I need your help. I need some of your programs. Information meltdown, he questions. More of a statement than a fact from more of a statement of fact from Peter than a question. It was only a matter of time. We've lost most systems, no phones, no ITU. I have to open the offices. Peter levers himself into a low slung sports car uncharacteristic in size and behaviour. I've never seen Peter rush and the pull of the acceleration which occurs when Peter puts his foot down is uncharacteristic. I'm curled up in the passenger seat, knees under my trin, dreading an accident which would drive my patellas into my skull. I think I know what to do, Peter says. That doesn't encourage my confidence. We have to send some of my animals into the network. These would deal with pads first. Then we get some stability back my mobile rings. The CRO, CEO is beside himself. Where are you? Raj says you've disappeared. I'm working on a solution. Be back in an hour. You must stay on the premises. You have your duty. I send a message back and the connection goes dead. Forgot to close the network. I hope the meltdown doesn't spread through the mobile network. Difficult to tell, Peter says. Everything's mobile nowadays. We stop in front of a tall glass-fronted building. The offices of individuality. I haven't been in your office before. Now's your chance to find out more. The lobby has a relaxed atmosphere. Large screen shows a forest scene. I can feel the breeze. I look twice. Small creatures are moving about between the trees. Their gaudy colours contrast with the pastel greens. But the creatures are active. 
They root through the undergrowth. They sidle up to the front of the screen and seem to look at me. We we'll use my office, Peter says. I've got an environment there. The offices of individuality are a hive of activity. The display I saw in the lobby is reproduced everywhere. Large screens, some extending from floor to ceiling, show exotic environments, deserts, oceans, reflective cityscapes. And they're all populated by creatures moving, probing. I didn't realise computer graphics was your main business. We don't do computer graphics, that's old computing. We hire a company to make things look nice. We're interested in the living entities and environments, that's our work. This is the world of new computing. Peter sits down in front of a massive screen that dwarfs even his stretched frame. Old computing is about machines. Artificial intelligence is just that, artificial. However clever a robot looks, it's just running through a series of logic instructions and doing what it's told. That's why it's a machine. Old computing creates the illusion of intelligence. Old computing just churns over calculations. Old computing is brittle. It can't adapt. If something goes wrong with one machine, it goes wrong with a lot because they're just programmed. So what's special about new computing? I've based it on life, John. Living systems don't just execute a series of instructions. The DNA defines a development path and, the abil and abilities to think, to make decisions emerge as the development path proceeds. In old computing, you define functions of the system. In new computing, you define possible development pathways towards functions. The functions emerge. So what's the advantage of that? Too many to describe. New computing is based on networks of dynamic interacting elements, pathways, connections. They develop over time, but they're all individual. Within some boundaries, they're different. If one breaks down, the rest don't. It's different from old computing. You design the development pathway, not the final product, etc., etc. So he goes and uses these creatures to recover the health systems just as his wife is giving um, birth. So what I've done there is I've got some concepts that I'm trying to get people to think about. I've got a problem situation where the issue, it's called information meltdowns, where there's too much complexity. And the complexity means that these brittle machines start to fail badly. And I've got the human interest bit to connect people and I'm connecting um, ideas of machines with the ideas of life and birth um, reflected through the wife going into labour and giving birth by the end of the story. So what I'd like to do is, um, I'm afraid it's me on the screen, I apologise for that, I'm going to get somebody else. I'd like to go for a talk that gives the background to this, um, it lasts for eight minutes, and then take some questions on that and um, we move on in the last 20 minutes to the third um, science fiction prototype. This is where the marriage of arts and sciences comes into its own. We computer scientists need permission to imagine, to express in poetry, art, plays, stories, to come up with the unconstrained what-ifs. Because it is in the proliferation of ideas that the way ahead lies. And science fiction prototyping provides the fitting room for trying on the garments of the future. Um, and I like the idea of it, um, science fiction prototyping as a fitting room. You take some future technology and you get people to try it on and through the story you explore what might happen. Any comments on that before I spend the last 15 minutes looking at um, the third prototype? Yeah. That's a really interesting thought. Maybe it's my pessimism coming across. I think you've got a very interesting point that um, when you're writing the, the stuff, you have a certain view of what might happen. I think that, um, I mean, if we look at the two we've done, there is a certain negativism about the first one, about the issues with getting your genome sequence, yes. And I think we have to face up to a with any technology, there'd be difficult areas and there'd be things that would go wrong. And we're all um, not perfect, wonderful people. They will be misused and we have to face that. But I think also, you're quite right, we need to use science fiction prototyping also to explore the good possibilities and how people's lives would change. And I apologise for that because I think it is a bit negative. 
And I'm very sorry, the third one is about to be about as negative as you can get. That's a great point, and that leads me on to the third one, which is about an era called responsible um, research and innovation that um, Bernd Stahl is working on. So the idea is in EU research and EPSR research, how do we be responsible about the way we use um, technology and looking forward? And I think this is not ju really just a negative thing, because if we want technology to be taken up, we want people to use the technology, we need to explore the issues and um, look at the context and the problems immediately. I mean, the failure, for example, across Europe of genetic manipulation, I'm not a fan one way or the, the other, but um, there was no attempt by the scientists to engage with the public, with the cultural context. And the result was the whole thing was thrown out. And it may be the baby was thrown out with the bathwater and you, you lost the whole thing. And that's a danger with technology, um, particularly with computer technology. You design something that's great with a possible good outcome, then you forget to consider people and how they will react to it and they all reject it and you don't get any value. I think that's partly what Brian Johnson's thinking about. We need to look at the consequences and find out how to use this effectively. But um, one thing Bert looks into is a need for structures and um, frameworks to get people to think and to treat um, technology in an appropriate way and to think ahead and to think what are the options. Um, and he is running a quite large research um, and responsibility in research and innovation program running across several EU projects. But we've explored the idea in really robot ethics and the use, what are the issues with the use of um, robots in social situations and in people's homes. And the last bit I want to go through very briefly, I'll spend one minute on, on um, what I'm saying and then we'll hear a bit of the um, play. So another, there's many ways of putting these things and what we've done here, what I did here was to use the radio play format. And in this story, the main protagonist is a robot researcher. And he's got three robots that um, he's put what he calls empathy machines in to try and get them to empathize with people um, and to model empathy. Um, he's going out in the morning to the, um, at his research institute. They're um, having a report back from an EU committee who have looked at the responsibility issues. And they're coming back to them during that day. And the outcome is not really good. They've taken three of these robots and put them in different situations and some fairly dubious things has happened. And really what we see is at the end that um, the empathy engine didn't work. It became a sympathy em engine. Um, but how do we get that for people to feel that and understand that. Well, what we do is we cast the story so there's actually several robots that this guy's put out and you don't quite know in the radio play that it actually is a robot until it's revealed. And one of the robots, I'll reveal a bit now, he puts with his mother who is getting older and needing support. So he's actually testing one of his robots with um, his mother. And the essence of the story is that the report back from the commission is fairly difficult and they're requiring that those robots are brought back in to containment because they're not um, working. There's one thing, the idea of containment comes from genetic manipulation where there's all sorts of ways of defining how you contain the um, genetic manipulated organisms. And what we're going to do is look at the, the play cuts between the meetings at the Science Institute with the EU people and their report back and the consequences and arguments around that and what's happening with Mary who is the older woman and Marta. And um, what we're going to do is look at four scenes of the interactions between Mary and Marta who I will reveal now is actually a robot but um, the radio audience won't realise that until when at the very last scene they realise that these robots are dysfunctional and they've left one with Mary and they try and get into a car to get there. And the question is, do they get there in time? So um, for five minutes or so, over to our actresses. Good morning, Mary. Shall I pull the curtain? Oh, yes, please. And would you like a cup of tea? That would be nice. There's no hurry to get off. No, I don't want to remain in bed. I'm uh, stiff enough as it is. Some morning my legs will hardly move. 
I'll get up when I've had a cup of tea. That's fine. I'll make breakfast. Have there been mes any messages for me? I don't think so. Uh, only I was expecting Chris to call. Are you worried? No, not really. Um, only he does usually call on a Tuesday. How was breakfast? Um, fine, thank you. I'll clear up now. No, that's all right. I, I need to do something. I don't want to vegetate. I can still stand uh, at the sink. Do you feel a bit useless? Sometimes. Has the po post come yet? No, shall I bring it when it arrives? Yes, please. I'm expecting something from the hospital. Here's the post, Mary. Thank you. There's a letter from the hospital. Yes. Uh, just as I thought. Bad news? Yes, very bad. Do you want me to hold your hands? No, Marta. Can I help? I'll tell you if you can. Uh, I don't know what to do, Marta. What did the hospital say was wrong? Motor neuron disease. Incurable. I've got two or three years with rapid deter deterioration. <laughs> I knew something was wrong when I fell over unexpectedly. My legs twitch now, my arms won't move properly. What will happen? I will end up a vegetable. Thinking but unable to move. Totally dependent and gradually all my muscles will stop working until I suffocate because my chest muscles won't work properly. I will help you, Mary. That's very kind, but it won't be enough. It'll be a terrible burden on Chris and the family. The care will cost so much, and it'll be a shock for Adam to watch his grandmother d degenerate. Still, I must tell them. I'll ring Julia. Chris must be at work. I'll get your mobile. Um, have you brought the pills and water, Marta? Yes. This will make me very sleepy. I won't feel anything. Have you brought the knife? I've sharpened it. That was helpful. This is all for the best. Adam will benefit. They can sell the house to get him to college. And I won't burden... I won't be a burden to Chris. Will you feel better, Mary? Yes. There will be no more worry, no more pain. I see you're worried. I wouldn't like to worry. It will be good to get rid of your worry. Just position the bucket, Marta. I already feel quite drowsy. Now position the knife. Here. That's right. Draw it across ever so carefully. It's dripping. A little more, a little more. That's right. You're so helpful, Marta. So the story is called an empathy engine and they've tried to install a so-called empathy engine into the robots and clearly they failed. And one of the EU inspectors who's looked at this failure of EU, uh, failure of the empathy engine in other situations with the robots says, um, um, yeah, I'm afraid what you've designed is very dan dangerous machine, Dr. Cheeseman. None of it showed up in the tests nor in the focus groups, although once you see it happen it seems obvious and inevitable. You've designed a sympathy engine, Dr. Cheeseman, not an empathy engine, a three-year-old who knows mummy is hurt and will do anything to make mummy feel better. An emotional infant, infant without genuine wisdom or judgment, more dangerous than a mindless machine. So that's why we can't let the technology outside these four walls. So the idea there is to try and get people to connect with some of the issues with robots and the limits of sort of robot technology, trying to do what humans would do. Because I mean, maybe a human would end up helping the woman um, commit suicide. But, um, you know, there'd be much more thought and empathy and um, it's less likely that that would happen. So we see with the science fiction prototypes, we've gone beyond the um, objective, pretending we're objective scientists looking at scenarios and um, statistics, and we've made it personal. We've made it subjective. We try to connect with people so that they will start thinking, what if I'm in this situation using this technology? What are the options? What are the problems? What is the value of it? How is it going to work in, cultural con in a cultural context? 
the Brian Johnson at Intel, that is what matters. Because he's aware that the value and the changes in technology as we look to the future are not driven by our ability to cram more um, transistors onto a microprocessor or to make more um, intelligent systems or even systems that connect with biological systems. The movement is based on the connection between the social and the technology, how people accept it, how it fits into how people's lives are changing. That's why I think in this Futurology sessions, it is much important to look at cultural change, at behavioural change, at how politics are affecting people, of what, of what's happening in the country at a political level, at an educational level, as it is to say, what type of cars will we be driving? We end up, if we're not careful, with the flying cars, the Flash Gordon's um, pictures, the um, ridiculous technology that never actually gets taken up because we haven't attempted to connect it with the subjective and the personal and the everyday life, the work situations, the home situations, the way we relate to each other. And that's why I think science fiction prototyping helps as another tool in looking to the future. And that's it, really. So we've got a minute or so for questions, I guess. Or Oh, I, I just, it's a very interesting talk, so thank you. Um, but I did want to pick up a bit more on the sort of the dystopian angle because I think I kind of, I felt it too when you answered, asked the question. I, I wondered if, sort of reflecting on that, you, you think that there might be, to use this technique, do you think there's an implicit kind of predicate that we're, we're exp the, the people developing the technologies have some kind of hubris or a kind of technocratic utopia that, oh, it'll be all all right, go for it, kind of, it'll be okay. And this is kind of as a, acting as a counter or a critique to that. I think I've found amongst engineers um, in some situations that there is that sort of, never mind the situation, we're interested in the technology. So in one example in Belfast, they invented technology that can process images very fast. Mm -hmm. So you can put a box, say you've got a, a road of houses, you can put a box at the front of the road and it's so fast with parallel process, it can process every image and detect pornography going up the houses and stuff like that. Or another one, you can put a, a video in a bus, you can connect it up to processing, it will look at the images and interpret when somebody's going to hit somebody and take action, stop the bus, ring up the police. And what they were doing, and they then said to them, well, what about the social issues? And the engineers said, that's for the lawyers, that's nothing to do with me. So I find there is a resistance to engaging with, with the social. There may be a worry that when they engage with it, they find the bad things, but I think there are the good things. And as I've said, if you want that technology to go on a bus, it buses, you have to be sensitive to those issues. What if it's the person on the bus a uh, mother with an autistic son who sometimes starts waving his hands about and nothing wrong at all. So do you see this uh, prototyping approach for the benefit of the person writing the story or is it for the audience that reads the story? Because in that sense it's actually the engineer would benefit from sitting down and thinking through all the possibilities of the social mm -hmm. construct. But I know a lot of the, uh, within your talk you were talking much more about the the benefit to the wider audience about mm -hmm. prompting thought processes where it strikes to me it's actually more an internal process to actually think out the books within the technology or potential mm -hmm. impl cultural implications. Which do you see? Well I think it's both. The bias I guess because of where I come from in computer science and Brian Johnson says he's paid by Intel to do this is that we're trying to get the engineers to look socially and say what's going on. But in terms of going out into classrooms, you know, debating on the radio or whatever, and getting people to think about it, I think it does have a wider audience, yeah. So that in society we begin to say, you know, what is the role for robots? Can we expand them? And you move beyond the sort of um, robots in Star Wars image. And you think, right, what, you know, what do we mean by a robot actually living in the house? What would they do? What would be the limits? Thank you very much for coming along and listening. Thank you.